answering your questions. You are listening to No Other Doctrine. This radio on demand show is pre recorded. Our faith should stand the test of time. To do that, it needs to be built on a foundation of solid doctrine. The Apostle Paul urges us in 1 Timothy 4.15 to give our attention to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. That's never been more important than it is now. Welcome to No Other Doctrine. This is your opportunity to call in with your questions live on the radio. Questions about doctrine, religion, and reasons for your faith. You can call in now at 338-5790. During the next hour, Pastor Scott Tom will answer your questions as we discover why doctrines of the Bible are the only ones that will remain for all eternity. Call with your questions now at 338-5790. That's 338-5790. And join us for No Other Doctrine. Well, good morning and welcome to the live call-in show, No Other Doctrine, with Pastor Scott Tom. This is the show that asks the question, why is the word abbreviate so long? And here's Pastor Scott Tom. Good morning. Morning. (laughs) Welcome into the studio. So we got those silly questions at the beginning of the show. You got your silly questions. You can email them in. And by silly questions, I mean, hey, do you have one of those silly questions? We've been doing this for months now. We're bowed out. So if you want us to continue with those silly questions, you've got to, uh, got to get on the, uh, computer there and send us some more silly questions and we'll put them on the air and maybe we'll give you a little, uh, spot there and let them know that it came from you. But if you want us to continue, we're in desperate need of <laughs> silly questions. So you can send them in at silly questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no other doctrine. Dot com. So we like those, don't we? Yeah, we like those. It's fun. It's just fun starting off the day, having fun, laughing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we're getting, we get into some serious doctrine, but that doesn't mean we have to be somber and sober about this and that we never have fun. It is the funnest thing in the world to get into God's word and to study it, to get answers for life's problems, to understand the world around us from God's perspective, and everything falls into place. It it just fits. And so we have comfort and peace. That's one of the ways that God gives us peace, is that you're not in darkness. When he says you're you're in the light, part of that is not just sin versus evil, but you're in the know. You understand how God created why he created, when he created, and the process and how he created us and to be certain individuals with a, with a soul. And we're going to begin to look at that distinctives that the scripture makes between the, the body and the soul. But we're finishing up the idea of creation versus evolution. And we're moving on, but we actually got a question in and this question came in not via email or by phone. But by snail mail, somebody sent in a postcard (laughs) with a question on it from one of our previous shows. And the postcard, I believe it's either from June or Joan, and I apologize, the ink got kind of smeared when it was sent through the mail. And uh, no doubt from the uh, mail service stopping and reading it, no, I'm teasing. Uh, But it says Pastor Scott, and it's talking about the Days of creation, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Is it true yom, which is the Hebrew word for day, is used for long periods as well as as a regular day? And yes, it is true. We talked about this. And I was going to kind of drop it. I had another email that came in from David who wanted me to talk more about it. Kind of told Dave, I emailed him back that, hey, we kind of covered the subject and I didn't want to go too deep into it. And you know, and then I'll see all the snoring on the other side. But apparently, this is something that a number of people want to hear about. And so, yes, Yom is used for a 24-hour period or for a longer period of time. For example, when it talks about the day of the Lord. 
and the day of the Lord is a longer period of time. Just like we can use day for a 24-hour period or for a longer period, like uh, when we say, well, back in my day, and that's usually talking about the time you grew up, which could be a decade, it could be a specific era. And when somebody's saying that, we know that's what they're talking about, but you usually know by the context. And so she says, is it critical to believe God created in six 24-hour days? Here's somebody who's paying attention because a lot of times we say, God, there were seven days of creation. Actually, technically, there wasn't. There was only six days. On the seventh day, he rested. There was no work being done. So it is six days of creation. And is it critical to believe this as a Christian? No, it's not one of the essentials that you have to believe. I mean, there are a lot of theories out there and theories that I didn't even go into. I'm going to go into one today that you probably never even heard of. But it has some merit. So is it critical to believe that God created in six 24-hour days? No, it's not critical to believe that. When we look at things that we have to believe in or we must believe in, they're, they're the essentials. In other words, if you take it out, you don't have Christianity. So if you take out Christ and who he is, if you take out that Christ is actually God manifest in the flesh, 100% man, 100% God, Then, if you take that out or change his nature, that's an essential. That person or that belief system would not be considered Christian. That's why we we take issue with people who follow other faiths but call themselves Christian. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. Some people in the Baha'i faith will say, well, we're, we're Christian also. People who deny, say, the Trinity or the inspiration of the Bible, those type of groups have put themselves outside of Orthodox Christianity. They're welcome to their beliefs, however incorrect. I mean, I, they, but they have that right to believe that, but they would be incorrect, and they'd be incorrect in calling themselves Christian because the Bible gives us that definition, not our own definition. The Bible's very strict in those areas. It gives us Those definitions, and by default, if we stray from that, we're not Christian. However, believing if the the first six days in in recorded history or the book of Genesis, days of creation, were longer periods of time or there were strict 24-hour periods of time is not part of the essentials of that because there are many godly people on both sides. And if you take that away, as long as you believe that God created and then God did that work, you you can be we can be wrong or off in the amount of time that it took or that he worked on the process so that answers your question and she also concluded you say read the bible literally but not everything is literal in the bible metaphors symbols etc we must see context and i appreciate that and let me make myself uh, clear though when uh, i say take the bible literal I'm usually very precise in in what I say. Not perfect, but I try to be very precise. I've been doing this for next to two decades. And when I say take the Bible literal, I always state it this way. I say you must take the Bible as literal as possible when interpreting the text. And so I don't say you take it always literal. I say take it as literal as possible. When would it not be possible? Well, when you get to areas like metaphors and symbols, where obviously uh, it's not talking about a actual event, some parables, that's when you look for what the the main purpose or theme is there, or let the Bible actually interpret that for you. But literal as possible is is uh, in other words, look at it literally first. If it makes no sense literal, then you move to the allegorical or the the symbolic, which every language uses symbols, and we all understand that because we used parables and those things. I slept like a baby, and we know what people mean by that. Now, I don't understand that because every parent knows babies are waking up all the time. You know, so I slept like a baby. I woke up every uh, four hours crying because I wanted somebody to come and feed me. <laughs> but uh, or, I, or I was sweating like a dog. 
yeah, dogs, you know, they don't sweat. So, but that meant they're working hard. So I don't understand some of these, but we understand what they mean and we know when to take it literal. So we don't look at the guy and see if he's panting, you know, <gasps> good doggy. So that's what, what, that's what I mean by taking it literal as possible. When it's not possible, we don't take it literal. It has a, a literal true meaning it's conveying, but it's not literal. Now let's look at though why I, I take those 24 hour day periods as being actual 24 hour day is because when scripture comes there and it, and it says that the evening and the morning was the first day, then what are you to, to consider about that? If I was to say I was gone for a week, you could say, well, he probably means seven days, but he could have meant that he was gone for a day, but it felt like a week. But if I said, man, I was gone for a week, seven full days, then what, how would you think I was meaning it? You would think that I was trying to make the point that it was a literal samana, literal week. Here we got in the first chapter of Genesis, we've got where it kind of gives us in the context the meaning being a little 24. Now, could it be longer? It could, but I take it as little as possible whenever I see someplace in Scripture because every time in church history when we've strayed from being as literal as possible, we've always been wrong. And so we've had to go back and refine those doctrines because it's proved us wrong as we learn more about the Word. Now, here's let me give you something that you probably uh, have never heard of. It's another creation theory. It's not real popular because it's not real well known out there. And it's called the fiat theory. Now, this is one of the ones that I... See, there's stuff I hold back from you guys. And I'm sorry, I apologize. Picture me hanging my head down, eyes cast to the floor. But yes, there's... You know, because there's so much that we we could go through. We We've been dealing with this for a while. There are things that, that I don't want to get into because they get either too complicated or, or I think they would be boring on the radio. One of the things that I'm holding back from you is it's called the fiat theory. And what this is, is that God commanded during those days what was to be made and that it was not, it was the construction started, but it wasn't necessarily always finished on that day. In other words, that uh, he commanded all the processes to come together and begin to work in that day, and that the process could continue for long periods of time. I'll give you an example so that you can understand. Well, in the fourth day that the stars were made. Now, that process is something that actually continues to today. Not every star that has ever existed was made on that day. No, because new stars are still being formed. You can look at, for example, the uh, Orion Nebula, where the gases come together and you get the hydrogen and the other stuff and you put in some eggs and then you cook it at for 350 for an hour and you get a star. I'm kidding, but stars still are being formed. So when God says in the fourth day that he created the stars, did he create all the stars at that time? No, but he put in the process for all stars to be made. But that process continues today. So for thousands of years, that process of going on, maybe millions of years, maybe billions of years. So this idea of the fiat theory is that God in a day spoke all these things into existence or put the manufacturing process in gear, and then began to make it all work out. And then the uh, uh, either a following day or a longer period of time between the days, something happened. Now, I still think there's some problems with this theory because if God created, for example, plants or animals that were millions of years apart, you're going to run into problems like over-oxygenation of the planet. If you have flowers and stuff, but you don't have bees, to pollinate them and to do different things that they're not going to mature. You're going to have difficulties with seeds and and other things. And you run into complex difficulties if these things are too far apart. Okay. But you look at this and you see that, for example, sometimes we think that God just spoke it and it was there. 
And so we kind of get that because out of he spoke it in the beginning, and then out of nothing, bara, then there was matter and everything. But look at the process, actually. Let's look at the uh, fourth day in verses 16 and uh, 19 of Genesis 1. It says, Then God made two great, great lights. Well, you see, in in the context here, you see that there's a progression. Before God did this, then God did that. So it's a progression. That He made the the greater light to rule the, the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made also the stars. And this means also means doesn't mean necessarily at the same time. So he could have made the sun, the moon, then started constructing the stars. He made the stars also to rule over the day and over the night and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the first day. And so these things were, were in the heavens to give light to the earth. The other thing it's showing us there is that creation could have been, that he's describing to us, could have been just for the galaxy that we're in. Okay, and the other stars and everything were already created, or that they were created in Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. And this is what I explained a couple of shows ago, is that this might be just the the six days of creation exclusively talking about our galaxy, because he says this is to give light to the earth. Well, there are stars out there that we we don't really get the light, and so... That may be excluded from the scripture he's talking about here. It could have been all together, and it could have been in a second. I'm not saying I believe the the fiat theory. I'm just throwing it out there because we got more questions about this, and it seems to be a popular idea. And so understand that some of these things could have taken a much longer period of time, and he could have created at the beginning all the matter and then concentrated, and so other stars were out there, other matter was out there, and so the six days are specifically about the galaxy that we're in. And so matter could, and the stars out there could be millions or billions of years old. And because God takes a process here. Let me give you another example before we go to a break. You know, when we get to the sixth day, God created man. But you go to chapter two and then you get, some people get confused because he's got the creation of man all over again. Don't be confused. It's just, that's a popular way of writing at the time. So they give you a synopsis, and then they come back and give you finer details of those things that are important. What's the most important thing in creation to God? That's right, us. And so he takes the time to say that he didn't just speak men into existence, but he got down and he formed men out of the dust of the earth. So he formed him, and and he molded him, and he, he created man, and then he created a woman from man. And so that was a process that he took. So he didn't just speak it, so it took time. And so that's why some of the people say it's a fiat theory. God speaks it, so he puts it in order, or he takes his time and he he forms it. Now, there's a couple things that come up here that, that this disturbs people, but it doesn't have to be disturbing. So I've gotten questions before in class when I've taught this, and some student would raise their hand, so I'm going to raise, I'm raising my hand for him, okay? And so they would say, Patrick Scott, doesn't that make it seem like God is not powerful if he took time? And so that's a good question, Harold. And so the answer is, because God takes his time doesn't mean he's any less powerful of a being. For example, a runner can run a, a mile, say, in under four minutes. That's incredibly powerful, incredibly fast. And it's crazy, man, to run that. Why would you do such a thing, kill your body like that? You can run it in six minutes, or you, like me, you can run it in, like, a day and a half. And so when you run it like that, it doesn't mean that that runner is less powerful if they take the time and say they jog it and say they take uh, six minutes to run it. For example, uh, I can go out and and instantly buy, I have the power to purchase a kitchen table. Got It's it's mine, it's in the mine right now. I put it in my truck and I go home. Or, like I did, I enjoy woodworking. And so I built our kitchen table. And it took time. But I, I enjoyed it. 
No, it's not the best looking kitchen table. You know, one of the leg is kind of crooked now. It's been kicked so many times. We've moved so, a couple of houses. So, you know, I've got to discuss some repair work. But you get the idea, right? The idea is I'm no less able to purchase a kitchen table if I turn around and I buy the parts and I make it myself because I enjoy that. God enjoys his creation. He created it. Now, a second question might come up as to why God did, God did over process or over this process we see that some animals went it's extinct or stars burn out or other things are going on. Understand this, that God created living things that could perish. He knew, he created a variety. He knew some would last and some wouldn't, but it's not eternal. So it, God's no less powerful if he lets, lets something go extinct because he didn't create them to be eternal. He created them to be temporal. And so they are going to die at some point and some whole groups of animals or insects or whatever may go extinct. Eventually, they're all going to go extinct because he's going to destroy the world and create a new heaven and new earth. So, that's some good questions. And we haven't really even got to where I was going to start today, but we started off with a postcard question. And we want to thank those people for for doing that. We uh, are going to go to a break. Uh, you can email questions in now or through the week at question at noothardoctrine.org. That's O-R-G. And we'll get back. We'll kind of talk about, well, how long has man been on the earth? Last week we talked about uh, why did God create? How did God create? And so after this break, we'll get back to that or to your questions. And you still have time to do that. We'll be back after this. Do you want a deep walk with God and be used by him? Do you want to learn from the best professors, pastors, and thought leaders in Christianity today? You can do this at a low cost and at your own pace at ccfcollege.com. It is a completely different type of school. The tests are about growing in character, not grades. We will add to your knowledge, but we really want to transform your life. Similar programs will cost you $18,000. However, the first 200 students in our program will get in for only $47 a month. After that, the price will go up. For information, text CCF College to 33444. That's CCF College to 33444. Or go to ccfcollege.com. That's ccfcollege.com. And we're back in studio and we're live every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock from 9 to 10 o'clock. This is your local Bible answer show here. And uh, I am a local pastor, pastor of Cross Christian Fellowship here in Albuquerque. You can come visit us. I have a great time of uh, fellowship. There's a place for the kids, so we still have child care and those things going on. And we'd be we'd love to meet you. So if you don't have a home fellowship, you don't have a home church, maybe you're new to Albuquerque or or you're a transplant, something like that. Hey, you can come out, join us. We teach verse by verse and have a great time of worship. It's casual dress, contemporary worship. You know what, what's fun and exciting about it is because I was with Calvary Chapel Golden Springs, my background for 18 years there. And, uh, we didn't, we wanted to do a work that wasn't just hinged upon man. You can set up a, a sign here, blah, blah, you know, here we are. And, Acme Church, you know, and everybody comes because of this, the name. So I, I just wanted to see God do a work where I wasn't relying on any name or man. We, no church underwrote us. We, we started by sending out some mailers and it was just the five members of my family at a, at a small Methodist church over by La Cueva High School. And on a Sunday night in the middle of uh, or the start of summer, they tell you this is not how you plant a church. But we should just send out some mailers saying, "Hey, we're we're planning a church," and uh, we had a home study going, but nobody in the home study could make it that week. So I didn't have a worship team. I didn't have uh, ushers, 
And that week, this was amazing because I was invited to a pastor's breakfast that week and said, okay, I'll go. I, you know, it'd be great to know some of the pastors and to do that. So what happened was I showed up and the guy who organized the pastor's meeting was not there. And there was only one other guy and he had been out of the United States for like two months. So he didn't know, really know what was going on. And then another visitor who was there. And so we were kind of just staring at one another, eating our eggs. And I said, well, uh, why don't we just pray for one another? What, what can I pray for you about? And I said, well, you know, we're launching a church this week, and I don't have a worship team. I don't have any ushers. I don't have anything like that. You just pray that God blesses and does the work. We'll survive, and my my girls will help, and my wife will help watch the kids, and my son will usher, and, you know, and I'll, boy, I won't worship. I won't sing because that, that'll drive everyone. No one will join. No one will come. And you know what? He goes, well, here, here, here's a card to my worship leader. Give him a call. I'll, I'll tell him to come help you. So we had these, we had two of the best, I didn't even know this at the time, but two of the best worship leaders in the city did our first service for us and came and did that. And, and, and at the time I didn't know that. I didn't know who they were. And so this was, it was awesome. God provided. And then some of my students from, from Calvary Chapel, Rio Grande Valley, down there with Ray Hadamio. I went down there. He used to be one of my students in California. Now he's this, this, this pastor in Berlin. I don't know what's going on in Berlin, but you guys are rocking down there. You know, you got this Walmart that's turned into a worship center and God's just doing a wonderful work down there. So he, when I came over, he goes, Hey, help me come set up a Bible college. So we set up a Bible college. We, unfortunately, it just went a year. I know he's still doing that, but we're lacking some teachers there. And so I taught the systematic theology in the classroom the first year I was back in Albuquerque. But some of the students said, hey, can we help? So they drove up from Berlin for months to usher and to help out. How cool is that? That's the way the body of Christ should work. That was so awesome. But here's the point I'm making is that I didn't have to have a name. I, I didn't have to have a church backing me. No one was giving us money. We actually just went and and did the work and saw God's hand move. And 30, I think it was 32 people came to that very first service. About 17 stayed and filtered in and out. That's how we launched. And then we went from that. Within six months, we were leasing a building and growing, and we doubled in size, and we just we couldn't. We had no more room. So we went to a theater and went mobile. Well, boy, we had to go to a very early hour because we had to meet before the uh, services, and that kind of hurt. We lost like about half the church. Normal, but painful. Then now we're, we got a building that we're looking, really looking forward to and we're in a much better spot and we're growing again. But the fun part is when I was with the, the, this big Calvary chapel and I love being there. I love, I was assistant pastor with Pastor Raul Reese and I enjoyed every minute being there except for it was very hard for me to fellowship with people because I was scurrying from the moment we got there. I'd leave my house about five in the morning, get to, get to work sometimes five thirty, six, depending sometimes. Normally it was, it was about five thirty. We'd start off in prayer. We'd get ready for the first service at seven thirty. So we'd go clean the bathrooms, do all this. Then you're making sure the sanctuary is clean and sometimes you're doing counseling and you're doing that. So sometimes I wouldn't even be able to sit in a service. My wife and family would be in there. They would try to save me a seat. And many times I'd have to tell her, look, honey, I'm not going to be able to make it in there. Somebody needs me. You know, they, they're going through something. But you know what ha- would happen? People would, would go in. You'd herd them in. And so you'd herd them in, right, for a service. And then you'd have to herd them out because you'd have to get the, the cars moved for the next service. And we'd have a 730 service, a 930 and 1130. And it just got more and more packed as the day went on. And so I didn't get a chance to meet people. And so now I can act, I actually feel like a pastor before. I kind of felt like administrator, uh, a fire putter outer, if you, if you would. And now I get to actually sit down with people and talk with them and I go to lunch with them. And I am really enjoying this time, but you can come out and visit us. 10 o'clock in the morning, you can go to our website at crossfellowship.org to get more information on that. 
We also have the sister website, which is noothardoctrine.org, and that's mostly just for this radio show. And we're keeping them slightly separate that way so that we have a broader reach in, in the ministry. And so we're not trying to just push our church in that. We're honestly being out there trying to edu- educate people so that we can uh, we can know our God and, and just fall in love with them and answer questions and we're non-denominational and and that way we can uh, minister to the 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 body of Christ as as needed but with sound doctrine and we can go from there and we can bless one another that's how the body of Christ is supposed to work and it often does sometimes you don't see it so there's my diatribe on what's going on with us so and I just want to let you know that today I'm okay and and if you don't know what that means it's not that I'm running my words together. I'm okay. It's a, it's a new word that I'm trying to get in the dictionary. I'm not just okay. I'm more than okay. I'm okay. And as a Christian, we're not just okay. We're okay. We're more than okay. Man, we've got eternal life. We've got a, a, a blessed walk. We can communicate and talk with and have a relationship with the God of the universe, the God who created these things. When we talk about creation, think about it. Everything you see, he spoke it into existence. He created, he formed it. And it's this incredible, awesome power, the most powerful being in the universe. And he cares and loves for you and he wants to interact with you. So because of that, I am Mo K. Mo K, we'll be back right after this commercial and we'll get to your questions and maybe get in some curriculum here. All right, be back in a minute. This episode of No Other Doctrine is not live, but you can connect with us right now on Facebook. We want to hear from you. Become part of our community. Also, on the No Other Doctrine website, you can see the full show notes and take advantage of other free downloads. That's noothardoctrine.org. Again, noothardoctrine.org. And we're back. We do have some calls coming in, so you can get in the queue. We have about 15 minutes, 16 minutes left on the show, so plenty of time to get to your question, 338-5790. And uh, I guess I was right about uh, the popularity of the creation days. We do have a, a question on that, and we're going to go out to a caller and uh, welcome in Steve. Steve's on the line, has a question about uh, the six days of creation. Hi, my brother. How are you? Good. Good, good. Hey, I've got a question for uh-huh. you. Um, when, in the book of Genesis, does it, does it, what word does it use for day? It, it uses the word yom, Y-O-M. Does that mean a literal day or it, a figurative day? It can mean both. And so you have to look in context. And so, for example, it uses the same term for the day of the Lord, and so that we know that that's a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it can be used for longer or a literal 24-hour day. And so you to figure it out, you have to kind of look in context. And that's where kind of the debate is in Christianity. Some are saying God really didn't mean 24 hours in, in the six days of creation. Others are saying, yes, he, he meant it. He said a night and a day, and so we mean he meant a literal 24 hours. Yeah, I... I think, I guess for myself, speaking for myself, I would think that when we <clears throat> when we don't take it literal, I think it's probably, in my opinion, okay, that it's that we're weak in our faith, that God literally is all powerful. <clears throat> I mean, when He raised people from the dead, it wasn't a gradual process; it was immediate. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I think. I don't know. I just think that God is, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he said he created it in one day, he created this in one day, and then the second day, he created this. And you made a really good point. He said, you said the first day and, or the first evening was the first day or something like that? In the, uh, yeah, well, scripture gives us the evening and the day was the first day. So I, I, I tend to, Take things as literal as possible. So I believe it's it's twenty four, literally twenty four hour days. 
Yeah, I do too. And I, I do too. Yeah, but some good Christians will take it longer than that. Now, uh, I know what you're saying, Steve, and you say, well, when God raised somebody up, it's right right at that time. But that's apples and oranges when you're doing that. If you want to compare, we don't have anything else to compare it to because we only have one creation account of God. We don't see him creating something else. And like when he creates the new heaven and new earth, it doesn't tell us how long he's going to take in doing that. Now, he can create it in a moment because he's that he's that powerful, or he can create it over a longer period of time. That's not really in question. The question really is in context, when God's communicating, when somebody says something and they want to make sure that you know how long of a period of time it is, it seems to me if somebody says a night and a day was the first day, then that would be something that you would take as literal. So if I, I use the example, if you were to take a week and I said, well, I was gone for seven full days, you would think that I'm saying a, I'm talking about a literal week. Right. And so that's the way I take it. But I've also allowed people to know that there are other theories from good godly Christians out there who have these different views, but it's not essential of Christianity. It is essential to believe that God did create, that we didn't evolve, because right. that's contradictory to Scripture. And, and there's so many doctrines tied to creation that if you, you remove that, then you remove things like the traditional marriage having a husband and a one man and one woman. If you don't believe in literal creation, then there's no reason to enforce marriage between a man and a woman. Right. See what I mean? So there's a number of, of doctrines that are tied to that. If you get rid of that, you're going to have multiple problems. So. And, and one thing we need to remember, too, is that God holds the entire universe in the span of his hand. So he's not the same size as we are in, that, in, in the sense that we, we view the universe. He holds it in the span of his hand. Right. So for him to create something in one day, if you if you can hold something that vast in your hand, I mean, it seems to me that our faith is the, the problem, not not his ability. Right. But I think what comes into play here is that as you get into the the scientific community, they're going to say, well, we have pretty good proof that, for example, stars are out there, and we know the distance that they're they are away from us. And uh, we know the speed at which light travels. So now if we see them, it would have taken millions of years for that light to have traveled to us. And so the uh, universe, or the at least the uh, creation, must be at least millions or billions of years old. And so that's where some people are trying to reconcile this uh, with science. And those scientists have some pretty good arguments. But uh, I also think that if you look at the first few verses in Genesis, they're not they're not tied necessarily to the six days of creation. And so matter and those things might be much older. But for us, we're generally a fairly young Earth and we're a fairly young planet. And what we're going to get into next is that man's history and man's length on the planet is is very young as well. So we've only been around uh, maybe six to 10,000 years maximum. And that's what the actual history says. And but doesn't the Bible say that he created the the earth and the stars that day in one day? So then, to <clears> me, it seems like the yeah. universe <clears throat> wouldn't necessarily be millions and billions of years old. No, it, it doesn't actually say that he did all the stars in one day. And, for example, like Orion Nebula is still creating stars. So he didn't create that star back at the beginning of the universe, that star that was just created at months ago in the Orion Nebula. Okay, so some of this stuff is is a process. So in in understanding that, we can see that the first two verses in Genesis doesn't necessarily have to be tied to the remaining verses there of creation. And so some of that material that he created because he said he went his spirit went over the earth and it was it was without form and it was void. And so when he does say that he created the sun and the moon and the stars, he says this is to give light to the earth. Well, you do have stars out there that don't give light to the earth. And therefore, does it mean that they were created too? Could have all in that one day. I'm not saying it isn't, but I'm also saying that if you, if you look at it as literal as possible, it isn't confining it to just, uh, to all the stars in the one day. And that's not me trying to fit it in there. That's actually looking at the text and saying, the text isn't actually saying he created every single star in that day. 
It's, it's actually a process. And so, again, take it as literal as possible and you actually get more in-depth understanding. Hmm. So, does that help there, Steve? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay. okay All right. Have a good day. All right. Thanks for the call. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So this is good. The making people think. I do believe in a little 24-hour day period, but when you look at the text, sometimes you're taught this over and over and we're, we're, we're like, okay, but wait a minute. I've never heard that. Or it's oftentimes we don't get that in depth into it from the pulpit. You can't because you lose people and that's not something that you would dig into and give out on the pulpit when you, you're really dealing with things that how does this apply to a person's life? Okay, what you want to do is establish that God did create, that we didn't evolve, and that's the main point you want to get out of the first verses because some of the other doctrines are key to it. So then you want your, with that authority and that in mind of creation, then you can teach with authority on marriage. And so you see how that follows. And so that's the application from that. But if we get into all these things from the pulpit, you lose people. And you have teenagers there who start to stick their gum underneath the seats. And so this is the kind of thing you do in a classroom or on the air like this where you can, you, people are like, ah, oh, okay. I, I didn't know that. Or they're like, uh, I don't think that's right. But then when you study a little bit and they're open minded, you say, okay, well, look, it is saying that he gave those things as light to the earth. So he might just be talking about that particular galaxy the Milky Way galaxy, because there are stars out there that don't give light to the earth, that when did he create those? Maybe not on that day. Maybe it was in the first few days of first few verses of Genesis when he created all those things. And they might might be much, much older than the rest. But from I believe that from those little 24 hour days were, were six literal days from uh, that point on, you know, we don't have to, you don't have to tweak the verses or anything like that. All you got to do is read them as really as literal as possible. And it, it actually gives you an understanding that there's, there's not only leeway there, there's some, we have to change our, our thought a little bit because that process of creating the stars wasn't an instant every star was made. That's not how the text reads technically in the Hebrew. Uh, it could be a process, and we know that stars are still being created today. So because of that process, we we it now, now lets us know that, hey, some of this could have been formed beforehand. Some of this uh, started there and could go on. So it, it, it actually fits with the scientific principles. Even though the Bible wasn't meant to be a scientific manuscript or textbook, it is textbook-like in the sense that it's never wrong in science. And any time where we've messed up, uh, we've never taken it as literal as possible. And so there you have it. So that, that brings it out. And so that's why I like teaching this in, in a classroom setting or over the radio like this, because people can call in and say, I've never quite heard it that way. Or could you clarify that? That's where you can get a, a fuller understanding on this and actually appreciate the scripture more and more. Cause the, the deeper you dig into it and the tighter the translation and the more you meditate on it, the actually the more accurate your understanding becomes and my understanding. And it, it truly is the way the world is. And so you don't have to go in and twist scripture and bend it. Well, that really means millions of years when it says day because there's other places you need to stretch it. Anytime I have to start saying that's what Scripture says, but it really doesn't mean that, you know, when it isn't obvious in, in the language, then you've got a problem. And I always feel uncomfortable doing that. I'd rather take it as literal as possible. If it's symbolic language and it's obviously not literal, then we don't we don't hold to that. We don't stick to that. So that's where we're where we're at. And so the, the thing is, is don't play loose and, and quick with scripture. You know, take your time, dig into it, be open to what the text is actually saying, because there are certain areas where we've kind of just been told or we've been taught a certain thing and we just kind of do it that way because that's the way it's always been taught. 
And it's not a new doctrine. I'm not putting out new doctrines there. It's just, you know, exacting of the principle, getting down to what the principle actually means. Well, what does it mean when it says that? And so we want to get in and dig in and find that. Now, you can't really do that that often. Why don't we hear more about that? Again, you can't do that from the pulpit that often. And so when you have Bible colleges and, and stuff like that, they'll get into it. Some will, some won't. Uh, here we do, and I try to stick to kind of what is the most popular and what is the most necessary. And I didn't think this was all necessary. But the past few weeks, we've had multiple calls and a, and a postcard and emails and now another call from Steve. So I, I took the time to kind of go over it again, hopefully not to bludgeon you to death with, in the head with it. And that wasn't my intent. But if I get multiple questions about it, it must be something that's weighing on people's mind. And so I'm going to stop and deal with it a little bit more in depth because that's the way we learn and because my responsibility as a pastor, as a teacher, is to make sure you understand to the best of my ability. And then I've done my job. And so that's what we do. So we appreciate you listening in and tuning in to No Other Doctrine each and every week. And it's our pleasure to bring it to you. Uh, we are in in the planning stages, and I know I've been saying this before, but we are in the planning stages of bringing No Other Doctrine seminars to you to actually teach you how to engage in conversations, how to overcome arguments from the world, bringing every vain thought or philosophy under control, and how to then witness your faith. How do, how do you take some of these things that we're talking about and put it in a very simple, concise method so that you memorize it, not in a very difficult, hard way, but in a very simple, fun way, that you would memorize it, have it memorized for the rest of your life. And so when you're questioning on things like this, like creation or the existence of God or the the whether Jesus was claimed to be God or not, that you have a very simple, concise answer that you can bring up and share your faith with. And if they come back with counter arguments, how to handle those in a very loving manner. So we're looking at doing that. No other doctrine seminar, no other doctrine course. And uh, it's going to be fun. It'll be light and fun, but it'll be, in a sense, in-depth. And you'll be able to, you know, today people don't believe in truth. They don't believe in certain things. And they're sometimes very antagonistic towards you. And they'll fire questions at you. How do you handle that? Hey, we're, we will teach you how to do that. But that's coming up. It's a tease, I know. But I, that's another thing I'm excited about. Once we get into this building, we can do things for the community and it's going to be so much fun. And so we'll we'll get that out in the coming months. Probably by May, June, we'll have sign-ups for that. So that's on the horizon. But again, thanks for tuning in to No Other Doctrine. This is Pastor Scott Tom. I'm Mo K, and blessed wishes to you. Thanks for joining us for No Other Doctrine. To find out more about Pastor Scott Tom and the ministry of Cross Christian Fellowship, make sure to visit the website at crossfellowship.org. We do hope you'll join us again next time as we continue to explore why the doctrine of God is the only doctrine that can bring eternal life. You've been listening to No Other Doctrine with Pastor Scott Tom. For more information, visit crossfellowship.org.